Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and part one of our message from Mark chapter 7 verses 1 through 13 titled The Bible versus Tradition. We call ourselves Bible Believers Fellowship because we believe the Bible is the final authority on all matters of which it speaks. All traditions, opinions, beliefs, and creeds are to submit to the plain words of the Holy Bible. In this message, Jesus is going to expose how that the religious teachers and leaders of his day had made the words of God of no effect by making their own man-made traditions the authority over God's words. Of course, that describes most Christian denominations today as well. We should also point out that in the English-speaking world, the superior and only infallible non-copyrighted accurate translation of the correct Hebrew and Greek texts is our authorized King James Version. That is why our website address is kjvbiblebelievers.com. With that, we invite you to join us, and if possible, join us with your King James Bible open to Mark chapter 7 and verse 1. We will study through verse 13 in our message titled, The Bible versus tradition. All right, you'll see the uh, similarity between what I have up here on the screen and what I have on the wall there, the Bible. King of all books. Not very many people believe that. And that includes professing Christians, that includes denominations, that includes the statements of faith of a lot of churches and denominations. Here, we call ourselves Bible Believers Fellowship because we want to emphasize that it's not about anything else. It's about the Bible. We come together in obedience to the Scripture and we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We pray. We pray for each other. We pray for others. We praise the Lord. We give praise reports testimonies, all those things. We fellowship. We love food. <laughs> yes. Amen. But the reason we come together is that book, if the one you're holding is a King James Bible, that's the book. And that's what it's all about. And uh, you're going to see that this is really the crux of the issue that causes people to reject Jesus Christ and His Gospel. This issue of putting the Bible in the right place in your attitude, in your respect, that's the crux of the issue. Um, in Mark chapter 7, verse 1, I want to see something here. It says in verse 1, Then came together unto Him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. Now, I want to say something. A lot of people will say that Bible believers are Pharisees. You'll hear that. They'll say, you bunch of Pharisees, and they'll say, you go by the letter of the law, and you don't go by the Spirit. Let me answer that. First of all, Jesus said, these words that I speak, they are Spirit, and they are life. If you're not going by those words, you're fleshly. I don't care how many times you're slain the Spirit, how much tongue speaking you do. I don't care how many of these charismatic preachers have laid hands on you, from Benny Hinn on down to Oral Roberts, and all the rest who've been around. It doesn't matter. That's not spirit. The spirit is... Are you getting slain in the spirit, Charlie? Because there's, there's room right here. Oh, yeah, I showed a video about this. It's on our Facebook group page. But, but people think that's what being spiritual is. It's having a feeling. You know, I'm not joking. That's what they think. That's what you'll see if you go to these churches and see these things. And... Um, you know, I've been in churches where the preacher's preaching and he's ripping off a real good message and all of a sudden someone stand up and say, Everybody just stops and says, Ooh. And then, and then they start playing music and everybody else gets up and starts doing their thing. And they start, oh, la, 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 you know, and they, that's not spiritual. The Word of God is the preeminence. And when, when someone is bringing the Word of God to you and someone else stands up and interrupts, that's not of God. God's not the author of confusion. 
How many of you have been in church services? Uh, maybe you haven't, but they'll be singing and carrying on. All of a sudden, the tongue speaking starts, and somebody over here will be, ba do ba da ba da And then over here, they're going, some my money, got it. And then all of a sudden, you've got 15 different people with no interpretation. That's flesh. You see, these Pharisees, they weren't Bible believing fundamentalists. That's what they call you. They weren't Bible-believing fundamentals. We're going to see they didn't put the Word of God up here. They put something else above it. So everyone you know who puts anything over top of that book, including their own opinion, they are the Pharisee. And you need to have that straight in your mind. Because you're going to spend the rest of your life dealing with people. If you deal with them, they're going to because they've been taught this, they're going to view you as the Pharisee. And no, the Pharisee is anyone who isn't a Bible believer who doesn't put the Bible at the top. All else is Phariseeism or Sadduceeism. The Pharisees were the ones who added all kinds of extra biblical rules and laws. The Sadducees are the ones who put their own opinions over the Word and didn't believe what the Bible said at all. The Pharisees covered the Word of God with the cloak of their own uh, a tradition and law. The Sadducees, they covered the Word of God with the cloak of unbelief. They rejected the resurrection, the bodily resurrection, and rejected angels, the existence of angels, all sorts of things. Now look at this. It says that these Pharisees and certain of the scribes, those are basically like uh, uh, the uh, attorneys of the day, uh, had their the fair, were the Pharisees, and then the scribes were the people who studied the law, and and you know broke it down to every little phrase, and and come up with all kinds of extra rules, and so that we don't violate. And all that. That's what you get from most preachers today when they stand up there and they preach like the scribes. They say, well, in the Hebrew, the actual better rendering would be. And we were talking about. Wednesday night in our Revelation 4 study, the word beast and the four beasts, and even some of the guys that through the years have been decent preachers, they always say, well, it's an unfortunate rendering in the King James Bible. Well, it ought to be living creatures or animals instead of beasts. How does that help? A beast, an animal, a living creature, I'm sorry, but you don't win. <laughs> That's not an improvement. And plus it destroys the, the continuity of the text, and we could go on and on about that. Chris was just show, uh, sharing the same thing. What was it you said that uh, you came across where they changed the word? Uh, where, as you know, you know, David slew Goliath in 2 Samuel. And uh, from what I, I took and read verses of King James Version, I, no, actually I was looking at, what was it, NS? The New Revised Standard. The New Revised Standard. I also saw the same thing in New World Translation, NIV, where actually it says Elihan, which is David's brother, slew the lion. <laughs> and like, I, and I, was, I was like, how do you make that mistake? <laughs> you can't make that mistake. He says, like, saying that Aaron parted the waters instead of Moses. Yeah, so he, and that's what's in those new Bibles. And I'll say it again and again and again. It's not because they're updating the language. They use a different Hebrew and Greek Bible. They actually use a Greek Old Testament. They call the Septuagint. It's not. It's the Vatican Bible. New versions come from a wrong Greek Bible. It's not just updating the language. It's the wrong Bible. They've switched it. So you stick with the King James. You're sticking with the Bible Christians have always used. And that's why... There are these huge differences. Yeah. That's what these scribes would do in their day. Now look, it says they came from Jerusalem. Where are we in our studies? Galilee. The Sea of Galilee. Actually went up to the northern part of it. So you look at how far these guys came. These Pharisees traveled nearly 100 miles to come from Jerusalem all the way up here. Think of that. This was this was they were there was no uh, Greyhound bus to take. They didn't have their own wheels. They were they were walking. They didn't all have camels even. There is most of them just walked hundred miles to confront Jesus. We're going to see how 
they weren't there because they wanted to see the truth. They were there to try to attack him, to trip him up. And there are people today who spend a large portion of their lives just trying to destroy Jesus. And that's been going on right up to this very day. And they're under the control of devils. They don't understand what they're doing is under the control of devils. They understand what they're doing, but they think it's intellectual. You ever heard of the Jesus Seminar? Mm -hmm. Satanic. But it's on History Channel, A&E, PBS. Every time you see them go to so-called scholars about the historical Jesus, you'll see them go to these devil-possessed men, a part of the Jesus Seminar. And they have spent their entire lives going to seminary and then becoming professors and continued studies for one purpose, and that is to convince you that that book you have in your hands is not from God, is not infallible. That's their purpose in life. Can you imagine? What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to grow up and destroy the Bible. <laughs> and yet that's what these little boys, they once were, grew up to do. Spend their entire lives trying to destroy that Bible. So I, I get angry, but I, I, I feel such pity. What a waste of human flesh. What a waste of a life. Going to stand before God, having tried to destroy His book your entire life? Wow. So in verse 2, read that with me. And when they saw some of His disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. And that's really what they do throughout Jesus' ministry. They're, they're not looking for the truth. They're not looking at the Scriptures to see if He's fulfilling the Scriptures. They're just simply looking for fault. Now, if you see sin, then yes, confront that. But there's little worse, I say little else worse, than being around a nitpicking fault finder. And... There are so many Christians today who are so uninformed on the major issues, and yet they will spend all their time nitpicking on things that really the Bible doesn't even deal with. The Bible doesn't deal with this issue that they're picking on Jesus about. The Talmud does. The Bible doesn't. And that's the way Christians are today. They will have blatant, open sin around them, and they will get upset about some nitpicky little thing. Choke, yeah, that's right. Gagging on a gnat and swallowing a camel. And that's what's going on with a lot of people, and that's why a lot of people get turned off to Christianity. It's because of all the nitpicky stuff, all the silly stuff. And we have to... I, I'm not going to jump on issues today and try to talk about that. I just want attitude. The attitude is what's important. What is your attitude? Is your attitude to major on the majors? Is your attitude... Uh, we have... We, we have uh, I'll just use an example of someone who uh, had some relatives that they were dealing with who... Uh, and uh, this person actually shared this openly. Uh, that they had relatives that were in unbelief and sin. I mean, there's major sin and they were away from God. But what they chose to major on was hairdos. How long a person's hair is. And, you know, the, the, you need to change that. You need to do something about your hair. They're in unbelief. They're unsaved. I don't care if... They, what are those wild-looking things that grow out? The, yeah, dreadlocks. I don't care if the kid had dreadlocks. <laughs> Who cares? He needs Jesus, not a haircut. Amen? And how many people suffer from that? I've shared the story of the girl I worked with who would not come to church because she had been nitpicked her whole life about how sinful it was for a woman to wear slacks. That's man's apparel. And I will not come to church without a dress. I said, we'll buy you a dress. No, I'm not taking charity. Couldn't win, couldn't win. So one day we're talking and I said, honey, some of you have heard this before, I apologize, but I, just, I looked at her and I said, honey, if, you, if I put on the pants you're wearing right now and walk down the street, everybody seeing me would think I was a transvestite. 
Those slacks are female apparel. The point is, just look like a woman, look like a man, that's it. I mean, we've got Scottish believers who wear kilts. Sure. That's a skirt. Amen? Amen? Am I making that up? No. So what am I going to do, condemn them? No, it's okay, because they're Scottish, but don't try that. Now, I, you come in here in a skirt, Chris, I'm going <laughs> to, you know... It better look manly. That's all I got to say. <laughs> yes, and no shaving of the legs. Because <laughs> that's what it's about, is looking like a man. I guarantee you, I put on a skirt, you're going to be saying, <laughs> that's definitely a man in a skirt. That's what you're going to say. But... but that's the major issue with a lot of people, that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of mindset that will lead you to be a Pharisee where you put things aren't in the Bible, but you'll put them up there above the Bible and make it the major issue. Read verse 3 with me. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. So that's what they were worrying about, this tradition of the elders. And it's found in the Talmud, not the Torah. Now, there were rules for going into the temple, and there was washing to be done when it came to that, because that was prefiguring the uh, life of the believer and needing to be saved by the shedding of blood. That's why you had the animal sacrifice and the shedding of blood. And then there was the washing by water in the temple court. That was to picture the washing of the watering of the Word that we experience as believers. So in the temple, there were these things, but these, this was every day, day in, day out, normal things. And they made a big deal. It'd be like, you know, me sitting back and we get ready to eat in a little bit and then uh, I see someone come out of the restroom and go in to eat. Now, I hope you wash your hands. But, you know, how do I know you actually came out of the restroom, you just came up the stairs or whatever, and then I judge you and say, hmm, I didn't hear the water run. Charlie, let me feel those hands. Other side, let me see. <laughs> you know, moms can do that kind of thing, but that's, you know, that's, that's a different issue. This is about uh, Orthodox, and even today, it goes on right up today, you go into Israel, the Orthodox and conservative, they call it conservative, they're kind of like the Sadducees. The Orthodox Jew of today is like the Pharisee, who's really... Talmudic, hardcore, all this, you know, that's the ones with the, the, they dress different and everything. Then you have the conservative Jews where they would look more like we do today, but they do have synagogue and they do go through the rituals and things, but they don't really believe all of it. You know, they buy into evolution and all that sort of thing. Then you have, I don't mention here, the reformed Jews, and those are people who just go to church just for a social reason. I mean, they're not even, they don't believe any of it. And, uh, those are the groups that even to this day are blind to the truths of Scripture and of Jesus as their Messiah because of this veil that Paul refers to. And the veil was the tradition of the elders. They couldn't see Jesus and they couldn't see Jesus in the Scriptures because they had this veil of the Talmud that they judged everything through. So they would read the Talmud and they studied the Talmud and then they missed everything in the Torah, the Psalms, the Prophets. And that's why they missed it. Here's, it's just a fact. All cults and false religions do this. When you say you do have to move somewhere and look for another church, your first question should be, what's your authority? And if your authority is that book, and in English it should be a King James Bible. If you move off to some other country, that would be a different language, then that's fine. But in English, it's that King James Bible. If they don't make that the authority, and they add anything else, right there, you're gone. Yeah, run. And that would keep, you, that'd keep a lot of people from getting involved in bad churches. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, if you read that in paragraph 82, says both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. 
See, they say they put the Scripture and tradition right here. But here's the thing. Anyone with two authorities has just made themselves the authority. Scripture and tradition equal, that makes you God. Because that way, anytime they disagree with each other, who gets to become the authority? Moi. Yeah. Yeah, the statement of faith doesn't play out in the reality. I sent my daughter before my eyes were open and she went to Catholic school her whole life. And you don't you don't crack. You're not, not even in the in the service. Yeah. And we were in eighth grade, we had to take a test on um, you know how they test your math and all that. Yeah. They test us on the scriptures. I got fifteen <laughs> percent. I mean, you just like, Hey man, why didn't you prepare me for this? Yeah. They and they want to make sure you don't know it. Huh. They don't want you to know. Yeah. That's why my yeah, mother we, got kicked out of the Angel Society. Yeah. Yeah. She, it's, she questioned too much about the Bible. You know, she wanted to know too much, and they didn't like it. Every she former out. every former Roman Catholic I know gives that same testimony. That that's one of the things that was amazing to them is to spend all those years and have never learned the Bible. Yeah. Tradition is a number one. That's right. Well, the interesting thing is, though, um, you take Scripture and tradition, and in the Catholic Church, who becomes the authority? The Pope. So that's why they call him Holy Father. He's their God on earth. Yes. He looks like Satan himself. Yeah. 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 Isn't it funny how sometimes these guys just look the part? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> the <devil wears> <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'll quote him again. Uh, uh, paragraph 97 says, Sacred tradition and sacred scripture mu make up a single sacred deposit of the Word of God. And again, like you said, that's a lie, but then that, it makes somebody else the authority between the two, and that's the Pope and the, tr and the, the whole system becomes an authority over the Word of God. Here's the Mormon's um, statement. I'm not going to go through all the false cults and religions. I just want to show you a couple examples. Just so you know, I'm not being, I'm not overstating the, the case. You go look it up, you're going to find... I know the Watchtower we talked about, they tell people that if you read the Bible alone without the Watchtower right there, that you're committing an act of apostasy. And if they find out you do that, you can be disfellowshipped. And I've met a Jehovah's Witness who was disfellowshipped because he was reading the Bible alone and having trouble swallowing their doctrine. So when he questioned things, they realized what was going on and he got pushed out. But in the Book of Mormon, or as far as the Book of Mormon, the Mormon Church says, quote, the Book of Mormon is the Word of God like the Bible. Now, if you ever read it, you know that's not true. It is, quote, it is Holy Scripture with form and content similar to that of the Bible. That's what's funny is Joseph Smith wrote it in the 19th century and it sounds like he lived in the 15th century. Both, again, quote, both books contain God's guidance as revealed to prophets as well as religious histories of different civilizations, end quote. Then they say, in the, this is in their Articles of Faith, Article 13, quote, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God, watch this, as far as it is translated correctly. Which we determine. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God, end quote. Now, folks, that first part of that sentence, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly, that's what most of your radio preachers and TV preachers believe today. That's why you better be very careful who you listen to, who you read, and what you watch, and any time they correct that book, forget it. Because that's what the, uh, they were taught to believe, and they believe it. So in verse 4, it continues and says, And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Um, this practice today is referred to as natilat yedayim. Useless information, I know. And <laughs> it, it, I, but I want to ask this question. Is tradition all bad? The answer is no. There is scriptural tradition, and I'll say this, any tradition that doesn't violate the scripture is fine. 
I mean, around my house, we have a tradition of eating peanut butter on our pancakes. And I have not found that to violate Scripture anywhere, and we are going to continue in that tradition. Amen? And I'm sure your family has... A, a, now, go home and try it before you knock it. Some of you give me this look on your face. We have converted many to that tradition. Did you? Why do you think I married her? We had to get that straight out first. But the Bible talks about tradition in a positive sense, but it's in scriptural tradition. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.15 real quick. It says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. That's talking about the teachings of the apostles. So tradition in the biblical sense is not always bad. You always have to ask the question, is this uh, biblical tradition or not? The apostles were teaching the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And so hold those traditions. Another reference is in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, verse 6. He says, Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us, the, the apostles. So, you, a lot of people will try to trick you on that when they're trying to defend tradition. They'll say, well, the Bible says you, sh you should follow tradition. Well, the Bible use of the word tradition in a positive sense is following tradition that came from the apostles. And that, to you, is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, etc., all the way through to Revelation. New Testament books and epistles. That's the tradition that you follow. That's what came from the apostles. Do you understand that? It's this. Biblical tradition versus human tradition. See? Anytime the, the bottom type of tradition, human tradition, goes against the top biblical tradition, then it's to be junked. The human tradition is to be trashed. And here's a warning given by Paul. In Colossians 2.8, and if you don't have this marked in your Bible, you ought to open your Bible, and you ought to mark this, underline it, memorize it. This is one of the most important warnings in the New Testament for you today. Colossians 2.8. I'll give you a second to turn there if you want to. Colossians 2 and verse 8. And it says, beware. Now, when a Bible verse starts with that word, what should you do? Beware. <laughs> Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the, watch this, tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Tradition of men, human tradition, bad. If it goes against the Scripture. And you should beware and not be deceived, not be spoiled. That concludes part one of our message from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13, titled The Bible Versus Tradition. Be sure to watch or listen to part two by visiting our website, kjvbiblebelievers.com, where you will find a wealth of audios, videos, articles, and links. If you would like to contact us, you can by simply going to our website and clicking on the Contact Us button at kjvbiblebelievers.com or send your letter to U.S. Postal Address Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. That address again is Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Pastor Greg, and on behalf of Bible Believers Fellowship in Worthington, Ohio, we thank you for listening.